of the monitor keeping podcast i think we are on episode 10 right now so thank you all for uh staying with us and listening and um you know <laughs> helping us get the kinks out through your feedback and uh helping us get a little more practice at doing this whole thing so uh again we just want to say thank you to the morelia python radio network um npr and eric burke over there for providing us this opportunity and the help that goes along with uh, learning this whole process to get information and content out to you guys. Uh, they're doing a lot of great work on, over there. So if you go onto their website, MoreliaPythonRadio.com, you know, look for the uh, Patreon so you can help support not only our podcast and NPR, but the other content they're putting out there. And there's some really cool, quick, uh, cool shows. If you guys aren't keeping up with them, I think another uh, podcast was just added, uh, the Reptile Fight Club with. Um, uh justin julander and i you'll have to forgive me i forget the other the other person on there but should be some really interesting uh information there so uh go ahead and check that out and uh other than that let's uh let's get to it kai how you doing hey man not too bad uh, how's everybody going doing uh we just just want to make sure we're flowing with the podcast where we talked about some of the information now um yeah uh, but yeah, it was a get... short podcast. It was uh, we we had yeah. a guest last week that um, it, we had some errors and it threw things off. And then we uh, were still learning the whole different time zones and when to talk to people. So we had to cut things a little short. Um, so you have to forgive yeah. us. We were just getting into some good stuff, trying to find some traction. And we were starting to touch on Indonesian monitor species and keeping and, and kind of how you go about that. So. Yeah. Um, now, as far as what we kind of covered prior in that first podcast, um, that we're hopefully going to be connected to this one, um, we're able to kind of just go through, um, for for the most part, what I, I particularly like to follow and kind of uh, teach everybody else. Um, essentially, your 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 preparation and everything like that into breeding them is going to be taking a while. It's not really just a one or two month process, cool them down, warm them back up. I mean, it, it can be, but really it's more so of a uh, pretty, I would say in, intensive or more strict. Um, I have a much, much, uh, I'd say much longer game plan. It's got several months um, played in there where, I'm at least uh, focusing on the weather and hopefully using that in my to my advantage, um, and also making sure that things aren't aren't too hot as well. Um, really, uh, I don't want to be all over the place right now, but um, we really were trying to have this chart that I was um, showing showing Alan. Um, yeah, did you have that saved by chance? Uh, I think I do. Yes. It's like somewhere in the conversation. I'm really trying to find it, but I know you sent it. To me. Yeah. Yeah. I sent it to you, but we'd messaged so much that it's like, quite, oh, I found it. All right. I got it. Okay. All right. So, um, really it's a chart that, uh, that entails many months. So basically the entire year, December to December, um, again, you know, and so, um, what, what I'm really trying to, um, show people is that it again it's not going to just take a couple months to breed these guys the preparation and everything like that is quite long so um for example you know um we talked about northern hemisphere stuff and southern hemisphere breeding and just on you know just what key factors are which and what you're going to try to apply to your to your own setup and how you want to be breeding right and so now as far as um as far as uh, like Alan's situation goes, and even myself, um, I'd love to follow the Southern Hemisphere where um, we'd essentially be following the weather pattern of where it's at, where these Indonesian animals are from, rather than uh, so much of road 
dealing with what we have here. But the fact is that we are here and we're dealing with this own weather. Um, and the fact that we have hot summers in California where we both live, um, we basically have be having a hard time keeping it extremely cool during mm -hmm. the hot summer times. And so what we're doing is uh, kind of lax on the, on the stuff then, but we're utilizing that as a time to cool them down or things like that. that that's what I'm trying to do. I can kind of manipulate it really just depending on the animal and how I have the enclosure. But um, most of these monitors are laying in between like a October to April stage, right? That, that window. And especially in and around November, December, and January, and even into February, they're laying a lot. Like those are when most, most of my animals are laying. But, but being in the community and seeing everybody else go through this with their own animals, it's showing up in, in just about every, every – everything with everybody and so um that's just something that you just don't you can't ignore and so within this time they are uh, essentially laying a whole lot now um for for me we would have to really adopt the northern hemisphere um you know schedule where you'd be cooling them down essentially or taking their temperatures down a little bit cooler um taking the humidity down much more and uh feeding a bit less for a few months um, and then warming them back up for spring and going through that breeding process. Now this is be quite a long time now in preparation. What I mean is getting their, getting the animal body tone and all that to a slim build. You're basically trying to get that animal lean as heck without being anorexic and or lethargic and sick, you know, and there, there are, there's a fine line between mm -hmm. that. Okay. So, and water and some substantial food or maintenance feeding is going to be the key to that. If you, if you think that you're just going to leave your animals alone for three months and think it, it'll be okay. Sometimes mm -hmm. after it's not okay. It's so the maintenance still happens, but it's just not like your regular everyday hardcore feeding or anything like that. It's really just possibly once a week or once every other week, things like that. Regularly drinking, you're always going to allow water and, or, um, you know, spritz the animal just a tad bit around the mouth or something like that to get it to drink. But um, it's that is also uh, just in the enclosure for the animal to still be able to do. Now, they're still going to have basking, but it's not just going to be as hot. And you can even take away the actual hot surface basking and only leave it like around 110-ish, give or take. And that's where I took my animals down too. And at nighttime, they even get to get to 65. So it'll be quite different during that time frame. And if you can be strict within that time frame of a few months, essentially bringing your animal down to a slim build. And for a few months, it'd be this way. So, you know, you're not, you're not just going for like a couple of weeks being thin or a month of being thin, but you're talking about a few months. And I've had other, other keepers utilize this for quite a few months now and really get a whole Long, long cycle out of their animals where they're just continually going. Um, I myself are, am doing that with my animals this year. Um, this last winter, I utilized that in my advantage and I took the chance to not fight my winter so much, right? And what I'm doing is um, uh, letting it cool down naturally. And so not adding more bulbs and I'm not, you know, shutting off anything that is or i'm not turning on uh, heaters to crank up the room anymore i'm actually letting it cool down and taking its uh essentially taking its toll on the room letting it get to about 60 65 degrees and naturally my room's not going to get any colder because of the current the current lamps in there already and so um you know you really uh you really want to be um sorry you really want to be paying attention to just uh Day, man lost my train of threw, thought. Threw, threw you off <laughs> yeah hey, I'm, off. I'm sitting here listening to you too like okay okay this is what we've been talking about yeah this is this part but basically yeah. you're dropping your animals down cooling them off right. um taking care of that body mass yeah and now, uh, that's been like a few months you know um and I, I basically was taking my animals down from summer through fall and really getting back up into um, like November and stuff like that is when, um, my animals were gearing back up. Um, now 
your your temperatures and doing all that stuff like that is going to be um, really important. So if you just let the room go all crazy in temperature and let it get either too cold or get let it get too hot, um, they're not going to really breed. Um, you want it to be pretty consistent the whole time. So if you're trying to be, you know, um, good on the coolness and you're obviously letting your enclosure or you're letting your whole room just get to like a hundred degrees or 90 something degrees, it's basically going to be working against you, you know, cause you're not able to. Right. Um, and so, yeah, you're, uh, it's going to be a little bit difficult for, I would say just the whole breeding thing and having that, that hookup for you. Mm -hmm. um, it will basically throw off the girls a little bit. I'm um, trying to take a look at this list here because I've actually made quite a few. And what it is, is it's, a, uh, you know, the bottom part is just aligned uh, all the months. And uh, I'm taking, really, they're, they're quite normal all the way from, let's say, December all the way until May. And then May, you can bring them down and basically start decreasing heat and decreasing food and moisture, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when you get into summertime, now this is for the Southern Hemisphere thing where you're now cooling them down this time, you know? So um, it's flipped for a lot of what we actually yeah. do. But you're talking right, about it's basically, um, it's, not, it's not normal, right? And right. so um, I'd be, they'd be basically at their lowest part in Indonesia during these times of the year where there's less clouds, it's less rainy, it's essentially their dry period. And um, the fact that there's less clouds in the sky at nighttime means that th during this time is when they actually get their coldest nights. Now, don't get me wrong, it's not like 40s and 30s and stuff like that, but it's still cooler than what it normally naturally is. Mm -hmm. And so um, these times from June to August-ish, give or take, is when I'm basically at their lowest. So they're basically going two to three months at a uh, very minimal food and all that stuff like that. And just sitting that way. So they're now at a level of just very, very low maintenance and, and all that stuff like that. Now, when I, when I'm getting into rearing them back up once August and September have come basically now slowly warming them back up and taking them, you know, with more food and things like this, this is how I used to do it. Um, when I first started trying to, cause obviously I'm trying to match with the Southern hemisphere, you know? Okay. But would you say that it was a little easier at that? Were, were you in the Bay area at that time or were you down South? Um, no, I was uh, in the Bay area at that time. Um, where temps are a little more stable throughout the year, wouldn't you say? Yeah. It's not as blistering hot during the summertime for sure, but it was still up there. Well, and yeah. the place I lived was small, so it got really hot. Um, but, uh, what I, I was still utilizing AC to keep the room from getting too hot though. Um, now, as far as what I was using then, I would basically try to warm them back up. And then right around November, they really were, um, they were really going at it. And um, only a couple animals were actually hooking up though. So I was actually getting um, maybe one clutch out of a, an animal and I was trying to figure out how to double clutch. Or I was actually just trying to figure out why they would only lay once compared to another gentleman that has the same type of animals lay every 60 days, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, he basically was telling me that his animals got down to 65 at nighttime. Um, he didn't really do anything else but allow that to happen, though. Okay. And then, you know, he's just uh, also have mangrove monitors. And his were basically cranking out every couple months every 60 days um and i was basically only doing it every four to six months give or take for the animals yeah. that i have right so it wasn't so often and i was trying to get to where he was at essentially because we had the same animals basically and and uh i wanted to also push my limits with mine because i wasn't really getting that great of clutches right um so what i needed to do was try to adopt what he was doing um and essentially give more optimum temperatures of uh, lows lows and highs as high as i can you know um and what i was able to get from my animals this year from december till now right man i'm, I'm i don't know i'm probably at like my 12th clutch of stuff mm -hmm. just 
just all together, you know, um, Kimberly's and mangroves all together. And I'm applying this to all the animals this last winter where um, I didn't fight it. I basically let all the cages come down. I didn't add higher, hotter bulbs at all. Uh, I let them dry up a bit. Um, I've limited all their food and for a few months. And then once, uh, for some of them, it was a little bit different. Like I think where some of them were being up top, um, they were really cued into breeding kind of right away, a lot sooner. But some of the animals at the very bottom didn't really start until when they got warmer, which was March. Okay. So, you know, some animals, um, I, I don't know, they were just ready to go right when like February hit, you know, and it started to, the, the temperature was now beginning to rise and it was no longer just 30s and 40s at nighttime, but back into 50s and 60s and 70s and stuff like that, you know, Um and so they, 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 they definitely get a feel of that. And um, that has been pretty successful as far as me understanding my animals. Now, what I did was gave them a reset. You know, mm -hmm. um, my summers. Okay, so leading, leading, this is why I talk about the time frame is so long. And it can basically go from when you really need it to as far as your, your, your end goal point which is obviously them laying and, you know, getting to that part. Right. But going back, you know, that's like really now I'm, I'm talking about my summer time before the breeding happened at all. So this is, if we're in May now, I'm talking about May of 2020 now. Okay. May, 2020, June, July, August, September, October, and November are very hot months here typically. Um, it's basically once it's like May, June, it's 90, a hundred degrees. Um, and so, you know, you were, we're really trying to keep my animals from being too hot. I really felt that they weren't doing too much breeding at all at that time. That, and that was the truth. No eggs, no breeding, very limited movement. Just, you know, they're trying to keep cool as, as, as much as I can say anything, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I even have my Kimberly's at recommended temperatures of 140, 150 surface temperatures. And they actually don't do anything. They actually hide, <laughs> it, right? But so I'll unscrew that second bulb that helped me get it to 140 and it'll be 120. And that's what that's them. So much, more more activity, much more activity, much more breeding. And it's crazy. I, 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 you know, going by what are some people are recommending and what's really working for me is the slightly cooler temperatures after the hot or the warm temperatures after the cold. Um, and that's just, it's just weird, right? I, I don't know how that really works. It, it just clicks for them. Um, rain is also a good one. That is also a great trigger as well. So um, this year has been a bit more dry uh, uh sorry yeah big basically drier so from last some last november till now it hasn't rained much at all but some storms have come through and the clouds are around so it is uh making it a little bit more humid and i can feel the air a little bit more saturated and i think that helps out a bit there was a few days of rain but not much i would say a couple weeks yeah but i'd say man if i had everything queued in and had a two uh, 2019's rain man that'd be crazy that was <laughs> a lot of rain that year you know and yeah. um i loved i actually didn't like it because it, it sprung a leak as well in my roof so i didn't Ooh. like it but um thanks to flex seal flex seal fixed the problem for me and you know um i was able to uh not stress over that so much um, but now I got, we got, we got all that fixed and everything like that. And so, and there's no more leak and, and no more mold or anything like that developing in the wall. Yeah. Um, yeah. I hope not. <laughs> there's no rain up there. So there's no rain lately. So that's been great, which is, which sucks though. Like don't get, I, I wish for rain and I want rain to still, and I'm actually glad that right now it hasn't been 90 degrees and it's getting into May and summertime and stuff like that coming up soon. It's actually just been sixties and 70 degrees, which has been amazing for me because my temperatures right now are great. They're just, everybody's still active everybody's doing well. And I'm not really worrying about animals overheating. And I'm also not using the AC that has the, the, the switch and balance and, and all that stuff like that in my house. So, um, but I'll, I'll eventually have to, I'll eventually have to. There's, um, a couple thoughts that come up just talking about this though. So 
you know, we like a certain level of control and uh, what would I say? Uh, stability. Um, we want to set our expectations. Consistency too. Yeah, consistency in captivity because we're trying to produce animals for ourselves, for the market out there. Uh, we correlated a lot of times to our level of, of husbandry, which I, I think in a lot of ways it can. But at the same time, um, you know, in the wild, I have to think that there's, even from my own experience, um, there's years where I see a lot more of this type of lizard than I usually do, a lot of the babies. Or um, whether it's the common ones around here, alligator lizards or blue It's like twice a year almost. It's like in spring and then it'll come again before they go down. Yeah. Right? right? Yeah, it, it definitely can in, in certain um, locations. Like we'll see a new baby in early spring, uh, just your common blue belly. And then we'll see one towards the end of the summer almost. And um, where the other ones we've kind of watched grow, you can kind of judge where they are. It's like now you got a new clutch hatching up. Um, but there's also years where we don't see that many of certain types of animals. So I have to, what, like you're talking about the rain, 2019's moisture, you know, with whatever, we, we can try to match the, the level of moisture and humidity, kind of make a, our own rain system, so to speak, inside of our cages. But we don't really have a control over that, uh, like the barometric pressure um, that goes with those rain systems that come in. And so I, I might be nerding out here a little bit, but, you know, we might have to just accept that in captivity, we're going to be at the mercy of um, the our seasons still. Yeah. And so we yeah. might have good years and bad years where we want consistency and we're trying to figure out all these things. Yeah. We might just have to, uh, we might just have to wait for a good season and other yeah. seasons it might be a little drier. It'd be a pain. So my, so my low, right? What I want to do is have my heat lamps achieve the basking temperatures, but have my room cooled enough where the coolest part of the cage still is seventy. That's, that's my goal, right? That's my goal. So, in in summertime, when in La Puente, where I'm at now, gets one fifteen, one eighteen, like it did last year, and basically killed me. Um, a picture trying to keep your house cool at <laughs> with an AC at, with that with that on, you know, it's it's, it's, yeah. it's hard, and so you just have to you'd be fighting against it. So rather than what I did, well, what I did was like I told you, um, basically during that summertime because I couldn't really have the heat lamps on, it was just basically overheating them with what the weather was already outside. I uh, basically then cut the heat lamps down a bit, you know, not so much basking and uh, shorter time periods and or just just smaller bulbs, right? I just mm -hmm. took it down, took it down a notch, and it's just less hot. And so they're also eating a bit less because I'm obviously not supposed to be feeding them when they're not, you know, getting so hot. I shouldn't be pounding them unless they are able to digest that, you know. Right. And so um, – and for a lot of people out there, sorry to interrupt real quick, but just for a lot of listeners that might be um, newer to this, um, I, I hope you're grasping a little bit of what, what Kai's saying as far as uh, how the amount of temperature and the types of temperatures you subject your animals to or you provide them have to go hand in hand with the food intake and, and what you're feeding them. So even if it's summer, if Kai's only – leaving those those cages on um, for a small time for them to bask and reach those temperatures. And the reason is because the overall ambience will just be too hot, which could, uh, you know, have a negative effect on the animals. He has basically uh, given them a small amount of time, but because he's only provided a small amount of time to reach those temperatures so that the overall throughout the day ambience stay low, um, he also restricts the feeding yeah. So that the animals can properly digest their food. I mean, they're, they're just, right. now, I just wanted to pick that apart a little so better. Like during the, okay, now let's say still where I'm at now, other people might suffer from this too, because a lot of other places get a hundred degrees. Um, I, at one point was a, a doing um, an inverted day and night cycle. Okay. I still go and utilize this here and there, um, but not anymore because I like my sleep. <laughs> Um, to be honest though, 
I used to just have my lights on at nighttime and then still fight the 100 and something degree day with the AC on just to keep those temperatures 70 at night, 70 during their, I'm, I'm using quotation marks. All right, you guys, but I'm using their nighttime because it's an inverted day and night cycle. So their lights are off in our normal daytime and on when we're asleep. Mm -hmm. All right. So that way they don't miss their basking time frame because if, I only had it on a couple hours during the morning time and then they turned off because the lamps were so hot and it basically kicked everything off. They wouldn't be getting their normal time to bask. So females would definitely suffer from that. Um, animals may even get a little bit sick or just not have enough time to be able to do anything. Um, and so you, def you definitely don't want to do any of that too. Now, I, uh, I want to make this clear that anybody <laughs> that is going to be copying this, when I say take them down, um, Shoot, that also is used. That term is used by uh, colubrid breeders and snake breeders too. Uh, I am not shutting off the heat. Okay, I just took it down a little bit. <laughs> the heat is still there. They're still able to bask, still able to do whatever they need to do and drink, but it's just not as hot. So, right. You know, you're not just all right. I'm going to take them down and boom, just unplug everything. No. And even if you were to gradually do it and then unplug everything, that's not what I'm asking. That's not what I'm recommending at all either. It's it's just slightly cooler temperatures, um, and that is consistent throughout a few months. Mm -hmm. It's not slightly cool for three weeks, you know. And you can uh, as quick as I've taken down like king snakes and and uh, corn snakes when I was younger. I think having them down for one month and then you know a part of another month going down and then a part of another month going up was all the time you needed to have those animals hook up, you know, um, when these monitors are a little bit more, more intricate, a little bit more timing now. Um, okay. So to say this is fact, I, I really can't really, um, I have a hundred percent proof behind that, but now that I've been able to cool my animals <laughs> properly, Okay, because I have only been doing this for a year and other people, I've only shown them this for the last year or two. So it's not like it's been 10, 20, 30 clutches of this. It's really been a year's time. And so I haven't had enough enough experience or enough to learn to say this is like this is exactly what it does. But because I've been able to take my animals down and rather just then heat them and feed them and expect them to do what they're doing. Um, they're actually taken down to a cool, cool temperature. And then, um, you know, basically uh, having their sort of what I say, brumation or cooling period, you know, and then from there, they're warmed back up. Mm -hmm. uh, and then so my animals now, instead of just having laid one clutch and then wait months and months and months, they're just popping, popping out and just, you know, um, even my mangroves, which normally wait a few months between laying are now going at it every 60 days. I mean, laying every 60 days. So they're going at it even sooner. As soon as that month mark hits, they're, they're going. So nice. um, I've been feeding them steady, not, nothing crazy to pound, nothing too much for pounding, but what my diet consists of promotes a lot of breeding. So mm -hmm. I use a lot of uh, vitamin A because my grasshoppers are high in vitamin A and protein and my crabs and shrimp like that are really high in calcium and they're still lean. So they're not making my animals too overweight. Like I used to when I was using rodents a few years ago, I still use rodents, just not as much. It's like a 25% of the diet now. It's definitely not like 50 to 75 like it was before, um, you know? And so, uh, yeah, your, your diet, into breeding may help out a lot um let's just say you've taken it from that uh that uh very very thin stage and they're these animals are going to be hungry but the fact but the fact that you've been keeping them a little bit cooler kind of works out it's yep. just light feeding and your your light heat and that all kind of just plays together once you crank them back up right gears are going now you just don't want to start cramming them right away you might might want to just brace them in and and you know um essentially cater them in a little bit with with some light feedings the first few days but 
bam, once you start introducing the heavy meals, because this is what you're trying to do is trigger the animals with uh, developing or having fat and enough protein to carry this. Um, and then also the calcium that comes along with developing the eggs and things like that to carry them when they're actually gravid. But to get them to just um, develop the ovum and go through vitellogenesis, right? Is that is that is that what we're talking about right now? Is that very first part is just triggering the fat to do, to do, to go into vitellogenesis, you know? Um, and um, from there, you know, I'm using eggs and mice and crabs and shrimp and chicks that have, you know, eggs, the yolk still in them, uh, using fertile egg that has the chick and the yolk in it, uh, things like that. I'm mean, reptile eggs or whatever that is really beneficial, not just uh, uh, like just pinkies, you know, not, not enough in that diet, even though it is a whole food item diet. They're the calcium levels and ratio on that animal as a pinky fed to a animal that you want to breed is just not enough. Um, I guess for dwarf monitors, it might be, but you have still had to dust those things because they're just, yeah. they're just meat, you know? And so then we're still taking, it's not enough because, because we're still adding calcium to it, you know? Um, now yeah, there's a lot more, you know, just to touch on that real quick, um, not to throw you off track, but I uh, shared with Kai, I, I left a, pinky on the uh, floor on the substrate of an enclosure that I knew those Ew. buffalo beetles were running around. <laughs> yeah. well, I, I did it and um, sure enough, they ate all the meat off of that pinky and I sent Kai a picture. Mm -hmm. now, I was surprised to see how much of a little skeleton was actually in a pinky. Now, yeah. it's still not, not substantial, but there is calcium mm, there. I don't, not, right. <laughs> I don't know why I, I just... I pictured them in my mind as just a gummy bear, <laughs> you know, so um, there, there is some in there, but still, yeah, I dust them for all my, you know, if I compare that to just looking at an egg and seeing the amount that probably just goes into yeah. shelling that egg and putting into that embryo, you know, there's. Right. And there's this is the only time I really use egg is that getting that because it's, it's collect you know, egg, they tell us the same thing. It's, you know, eggs will make you fat because they just, just cholesterol, right? Or whatever eggs are. All right. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the truth behind eating, uh, yoked eggs. And, um, uh, it's the same thing for the animals. They, they take it the same way. They get a little pudgy and, and, uh, and yeah, that's what you want, um, for that part. Now I don't feed egg every meal on the regular or even weekly to some animals. Um, but, for that purpose to help trigger some animals coming out of that thin stage i need to put some weight back onto them fast have stuff that'll trigger and cause some fat growth within them to develop that's 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 what i want um yeah i think you know we're, we're talking about some of this stuff but i think um you ha you have a much more measured approach to all this i mean one i think it's part of the dedication and, and just your style of doing things just really figuring it out and the, the people you've, you've shared on other episodes where you've actually talked to people in Indonesia, you've kind of sought out this program to be on to stay consistent so that you can measure your own progress in a way and your animals. Um, I think some people, <clears throat> myself included to a certain degree, arrive there just because um, we do flip our animals from like we're talking about a Southern hemisphere to a Northern hemisphere, but we yeah. do it a lot more subconsciously without this much um, information going into what we're actually doing. Yeah. You know, a lot of people still apply the heat them and feed them. We just don't realize what we're doing in the process. Like the animals kind of cool down because our, our ambience around us are cooling down and then brings them through the cycle. And I think that's happened quite a bit with, um, with animals, Indonesian monitors that people keep from the Southern hemisphere where and maybe a lot of the tree monitors where now they have grown into a certain system. And of course, captive bred animals being born at that certain time of year, which represents, you know, kind of that flip system in our care, unless they were um, from a, like a, a wild caught gravid type of female. I wonder if it's more natural for the babies. And then we have more success with cat. That's one of the reasons we have more success with captive bred animals being on kind of this northern hemisphere hemisphere schedule straight out of the egg so just a thought yeah 
Um, now, I've really only been doing this for a year, so maybe in a few years we can be able to say, all right, he's been using this method. It always hooks up for him. And um, I am now trying to figure out how to stop my animals. That's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're, all going to be, they're all going to be laying um, – uh, I have one Kimberly on her first, another on her fifth or sixth, I think six since December, like the end of nice. December, January, right? Nice. So, um, and then I have uh, a few Kai Islands that are on one and two, and those are all infertile. And then I have um, Solomon Island Indicus that are i have one female that is on number three right now and uh we're into march so, or sorry may so um uh that, that for me is enough um i don't need them to crank enough they're still my pets so at the end of the day i'm always thinking okay i want to breed you obviously it's the smart thing to do you want this is your goal right but my i don't want to push them you know that's uh that's mm -hmm. not what i intend to do as far as um, killing them. I, I don't want to do that. Um, I really love them. I, I do care for them a lot and they are treasured in a way. Um, they do teach me quite a bit as well. And so um, I do, I have figured out, you know, what just enough where should I, I'm putting them in danger, but I'm not killing them, you know, like right. breeding them and <clears throat> taking their temperatures down where most people are telling you not to do something like that. Or, um, I'm kind of, testing my boundaries with them. So I obviously don't want to do that in a sense where I'm going to just kill them though. So right. um, me realizing that they've already bred two to three times within just five months is enough. You know, uh, as a reptile keeper, the for this long, I've, I've, I've grown to know that, that within that is, is a good number already. You know, any, any more is great. icing on the cake. Um, any less uh, would be just about average is what I was getting before, but now I'm actually getting animals that are laying all the time, and um, I want to learn how to get them to stop. So <laughs> um, I also don't want to kill them, and also if they keep on going, um, this is where I'm having a, a back and forth with because if they want to keep going and I stop them, is that going to kill them? Hmm. And then, you know... Um, or make complications for actual needing the resources, which is great basking temperatures, good solid humidity to carry them through with as well, and and then the regular eating. But if I'm taking them down, um, and they're still their bodies are still going through this, which I've had them do, um, you know, what am I supposed to do? Like cater to it now? So that's what I've been doing. Is you know, I, I stopped stopping them obviously because it was possibly going to kill them if it wasn't enough support. You know, that, that's exactly what it is, is if I was kind of cut them off, dang, that means I got to cool them down, stop feeding them and, or, you know, basically neglect them a little bit. Right. Or just have that maintenance deal again. Um, so I've actually now been catering to them and supporting them and putting them back into the mix where if they're going to be breeding and laying, they've got a male. And, you know, if they um, are going through even without the male and they're gravid again and they'd have, they have eggs that they want to drop, they're heated and fed enough to be able to carry them through. And so my support has not changed on that level. I've uh, gone back to just heating and feeding them this time where I haven't cut anybody off yet. Um, right. yet now i just had a female and alan was going to ask this just earlier but i might as well uh, answer your question for you now um uh, i had a female go under for two days oh, roughly right, 48 yeah. hours right and uh um she came up yesterday probably around like 7 p.m i left the lights on her for to come up as well um and uh she laid I think four eggs, one looked okay, um, and the rest were all duds. Hmm. And I think she's done. I'm, I'm not sure. I may have to add another male to see if it's the male instead that is kind of just tired and pooped out because he did not – I did not witness much 
for any locking, probably a little cording, and I might have missed the lock because, you know, obviously I'm not there 24-7, um, but um, nothing really took from that. And the one good egg, as a description, as I shine the light through it, glowed really, really light pale yellow rather than a tingy orange, which is normally a furl egg, right? Um, and I mean, I've also had yellowish eggs shine through and then develop something later, but this egg just looked, um, like it was lacking, you know, that was, yeah. if it was saying anything. And so, um, it also was uh, slightly discolored and the egg looked like a Milky Way egg where part of it was, um, white and the normal egg shell color. And then part of it was like see-through and it was kind of all fused all over the egg rather than just having a directional pattern and lines. But it was like, yeah, just all mixed together, like tie-dye or something. And so it was yellow and white egg. And then it also had the oocytes on it, which are the little bumps all over the egg. And um, so it could have been me or me basically not feeding that female enough during that time and and also the male not breeding with her. And then she just still laid them. And just, I'm surprised yeah. because she laid a clutch not too long ago as well. And, um, you know, I want to stop them. I want to be just say, be like, hey, you know, you're done. Can I, can we just can we just not anymore? You know. <laughs> so, um, you know, can you just go in a cage by yourself and I, I, it'll be fine. But I just don't want to feed you a lot, you know, and. And I just, I don't want you to keep on going and then die on me, you know, right. but I've been supporting them quite well. Um, uh, as far as regular feedings, my, the grasshoppers that I use and, um, the, the amount of chicks and quail and things like that, that I also work with as well. Um, I don't really feed them dubious and I don't feed them crickets. Yeah. Well, Mr. Guy that breeds grasshoppers. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't use those bugs too often because they're, <laughs> they're not friendly to me. <laughs> they're yeah. uh, very, very. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I just, I just don't like when I order a bunch of crickets, like two thousand, and I'm really only getting about seven hundred because yeah. most of them are dead and that, and uh, you know, I so you know, obviously the money that you get. It's just it's just not there um and then when you set them up if your temperatures are different from what that species needs or what the place was keeping them at or let's say they shipped you a box that was sitting there for a whole week to begin with um without any sustenance and food to carry them over you're basically just going to get a box with carcasses and, yep <laughs> and you so know I, I hated that i just picked up a box of a thousand crickets yesterday <laughs> And you mean a box of 200 crickets? <laughs> it, it was actually pretty decent. I would I would say upwards of 500 still in there, pretty good. Um, but I mean, you're only a thousand though. I know, and, I know. And most people don't gripe about it because it's like, <clears throat> damn, you know, this happens, right? But right. but dude, you should get your money's worth, you know. And so it's like, fortunately, I I do take a picture as soon as I open it and they work pretty good with me for it's a local place I go through. Um, so I'm kind of fortunate. They actually do take care of me pretty well. Um, but I can go through that 500 crickets in, in a day. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 I wiped it out yesterday. I got down to it. And part of the reason I, I could probably get by with less if I kept individual animals and then yeah. I wouldn't worry about it as much. But when I, when I have these groups of animals, I don't want, animals competing for the same uh, amount. my lot. animals don't even go after crickets like they That's don't a, it's like beneath them yeah it's like peasant peasant food or something i and have a few like that i have a few yeah. like that most of the australian stuff go after the uh the cricket the dwarf like what the heck this is small yeah and so yeah that then they turn their noses up uh, the little babies uh still love them you know and that's the only time i go back to crickets because yeah. the little babies consume so much and the crickets give them that ground floor chase, which is fine. Right. Um, I'd really just hate the chirping and I hate the, the um, Buffalo beetles. And <clears throat> and that kind of thing. So oh, the, man. the cargo bugs. Yeah. Right. Is, 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 is enough for me. And I, I, I actually am very lucky that I don't have uh, those nasty infestations really, you know, I try to limit them for one for sure, but um, 
just by not having nasty crickets and dubious. Um, you know, not everybody's going to have that luxury. And, um, you know, you want to do things that are just going to be benefiting you as the way you keep them. Um, I use like right. super fine, fine mesh, fine mesh cages for the dubias and stuff like that when I have them. So no gnats get in there, um, but they can still breathe and yeah, just things like that. So, um, yeah, I got to do the, so right now the, the idea I have, cause, um, the roaches in my, in my setup, like where I'm doing things is easier for me to, to do i can kind of skip them for a day if i need to um and so it's not an everyday thing for me so it works better for my schedule but um you know i i started with three different species and um <clears throat> i have some of these dusky cave roaches some of these ivory roaches and then the dubias you got all the wrong species oh yeah man <laughs> well the, the dubias are okay but um, yeah, I definitely got a uh, about 300 uh, lobster roaches, and I'm pretty sure that's what I'm going to be rocking into the future. Here is a lot of those lobster roaches. Um, so the other, the ivory, they're cool. The duskies are cool. They're kind of big, but <laughs> they are not prolific breeders. Those no. are for kind of like roach enthusiasts. I think you could set them up. Yeah. Cool. They they kind of they ha they kind of do have their own little intelligence and personality, but yeah. um, I need things that you know are fast. Yeah, yeah. They breed, that breed fast really. Um, I I'm I used to do lobsters and I even had a uh, lateralis, which are um, the red runners for a while. Um, I I definitely hated the red runners. Like yeah, I hated the the pungents that they the pungent smell that they throw off when you grab a bunch of them it's it's really horrible um the lobster roaches aren't as bad but it, you can still get a whiff of that you know after you disturb them and there's just this this smell i'm highly allergic to all that stuff the dust oh, and, and stuff yeah so it sucks i couldn't do i used to want to do dubias and i even had several bins going at once um but it was killing me it was just making my respiratory issues even worse and so i i couldn't do it and that's why i do the grasshoppers only because there is absolutely none of what you deal with with as far as dubias and crickets go like there's no smell there's uh you know no chirping and any of that stuff like that and that's why um that's why i do them and i basically i'm not allergic to any of the frass or any of that because they don't really have any of that bad stuff um there's just the catching yeah. them. That's, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that part I've tried to uh, simplify over the last couple of years a bit, and I've had some help with that. And so, um, you know, my friend Cody uh, made, basically made this sleeve, and I apply it to the cage, and I can get in and out without having them jump out at my feet, which they were <clears> doing <throat> before. Um, even even in a year into it, you know, I was doing a different method where I was getting into the enclosure by. Uh, by having like a false curtain and I would sneak through the curtain and um, yeah. that was doing okay. It was uh, definitely not allowing a bunch of them to jump out, but still allowing a couple. And yeah. And so now I'm trying to ch changed up my methods, made things simpler, but yeah, they still are hard to catch. I can't catch a hundred at once, you know, or 500 at once. I can only catch uh, like two or three. And, yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, then I got to put them in the cup or dust them and, throw them in the cage pretty quickly. Yeah, they, they can be, they can be tricky. That definitely, for sure. They can definitely be tricky. How many, how many hours a day do you think you spend on just grasshoppers? Uh, maybe 15, 20 hours. In a day? Yeah. I mean, if you like add me going to go get stuff, me cupping stuff, me switching stuff over, um, like, yeah, I'd periodically throughout the whole day, you know, um, so that, like I'm when you're messaging me late at nighttime, I'm feeding grasshoppers. And so when I would normally be sleeping, right, I'm I'm doing things from a like it's, you know, most people are sleeping from 12 to four in the morning, but I'm typically up at that time and feeding twice in that in that time. So I'll probably feed them like 11, 12 so I can get some sleep. Right. And then three or four in the morning when I'm checking things and or I need to go to the restroom, right? I'll feed them again because they'll be out. And then I do that regularly. And so sometimes feeding them leads into other things that lasts a couple hours. 
like I'll be rotating them and things like that. And so it really just depends. Some days are, you know, they're smooth. They're just a few hours. And, but the days that are with shipping and, or shipping and packing, I mean, that's yeah. all day. It's all morning. So I'll start at 5 a.m., get all the stuff ready, cup stuff one by one. So it really just depends on the order. It can be 500, 1,000 grasshoppers, and I got to cup all those. Um, I can get that done pretty fast if I am swift and I'm not, like, you know, doing other stuff. But um, I, I always end up doing other stuff. So it kind of leads out a little bit. But, you know, easily a couple hours if you are if you got 1,000 to cup, you know. Um, wow. Yeah, that's so a lot more than I realized. So then, uh, yeah, it's uh, I mean, that's because I'm doing all that. If you're just a, a breed of uh, some doing it for yourself, you're just going to grab them out of the cage and throw them into another cage. But yeah. I have to cut them individually and then, you know, obviously pack them, ship them properly, and go to USPS and all that stuff like that, or FedEx or whatever I'm using at the time. And yeah, and then shipping out. So that, that it's uh, it can be. It can be a pretty long process, but I'm definitely feeding every three or four hours for sure. Like there's, there's me, there's no me missing it. I can probably um, get by for a session or two by just doubling up one time, but they'll demolish all that by the time I'm back, which is, you know, let's say I need to go out for six hours, you know, and I actually am needed. I actually need to spend time and do other stuff or I'm leaving, you know, but a lot of times it's me. Going somewhere, sure, we have to, you know, uh, let's say me and my lady want to go to the beach, right? And we want to spend some hours there. Really, we're probably going to spend an hour or two there and then come back. And so I have to take care of stuff, you know. Um, so The downside yes. to actually kind of trying to keep a biblical yeah. plague in your heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm – uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to. It's a lot to keep up with. That's why you know prices are where they're at, and also time because it's not just. A, I, I don't do what I do with roaches, and I yeah. same thing with crickets. These things are very easy to do. Um, these grasshoppers are a bit more demanding, I'd say. Um, and then you know, let's say if I just have to transfer some from one cage to the next. Uh, yeah, that's a shoot me in the face type deal. Um, you know, just, just with, uh, the amount of, you got to pick through the different sizes, pick out the big ones. So they don't have, they aren't in competition with the little ones. Um, so the little ones can grow properly. Uh, you know, just things like that, where that right there is a very, I have to do that tonight too. That's a very time consuming thing. Um, and it's, uh, part of the day you know and so you know it might let's say if everything else is an hour like feeding all of them making sure all the soil is good is an hour um like that part of the day is like four hours or something like that so yeah it's a so, whole time job basically that's why i don't have a that's why i don't have a normal job anymore i basically quit that one so i can do this one full time almost or by those grasshoppers people yeah this man's man. dying over here <laughs> <clears throat> yeah yeah so you know you want to um they're they are they're great for everything but you know i don't want to be biased you know you, you want to ask other people that have been using them um but as far as a go-to in usage for animals that are finicky just imported, um, not keeping weight, uh, don't want to eat what you offer, but they all of a sudden eat the grasshoppers. Yeah, this is uh, this is the your your ticket here. Um, also, if I'm comparing uh, meat to shell ratio, you're taking a let's say you're taking a large dubia, which is a female. Okay, it's a lot bigger than a male and a lot more sustenance, but that shell is quite heavy. It's thick. And sometimes when you look at the poop, they don't even, it's not even digested. Mm -hmm. These grasshoppers are more meat than shell. And so they may look robust to the touch or to the, I'm sorry, uh, they may look robust to the normal quick appearance, but to the touch, they're actually quite soft. And so the animal is going to be able to digest all that without having any of the chitin or anything like that inside their gut and, or being harder to process. Um, I've had now maybe I can count on two hands or three hands of different people that I've brought their animals 
back to life. Um, yeah. And they've essentially uh, got in females or animals from who knows. And basically they did not or are not acclimating well. And they're essentially not eating um, the food that's given them or essentially not taking it with gusto. They may eat it to survive, but they're, they're basically being hard to work with. And then all of a sudden, when you throw the grasshoppers in, things have changed. So, um, well, I can attest to it, you know, so you're yeah. not just speaking for yourself. I would, um, as soon as I go into the grasshopper cage and they start jumping around, all the Australian monitors in the room got their front claws against the, the glass and they're looking yeah. out with one eye like, is it me? Is it me? You know? Yeah, and, all um, are the same. Yeah, but then the blue trees, they would stay in one hide and they didn't want to come out. Even when I would leave Dubia out for them, uh, for those of you that know and feed Dubia, they, these animals would not let me feed them from tongs. So that's out of the picture. So now I was leaving Dubia in a dish that they couldn't get out of. Problem with Dubia is they will just stop moving very quickly and they'll yeah. just totally stay dead. And those animals, there was no reaction to that they weren't coming out of that high to investigate um they didn't want to bother it they were stressed out uh in a new place when i first acquired them um and it was i would say it wasn't getting scary yet but i could tell that these animals were losing a little bit of weight and at that point i started chucking those uh chucking those grasshoppers in there and it was enough just from them moving around hopping around um and me, honestly, I had to grab the animals out of the hide. And once they were running around the cage, like, like animals, <laughs> uh, crazy, you know, they were kicking up all these grasshoppers that were already in the cage. And once I left, I noticed, okay, these things are disappearing. Then I went back to leaving a, a dish of dubia, which they were now more willing to crawl across or investigate. And, uh, so they've, they've taken on to that now. Now I see them out a lot more. So, um, I can definitely attest to these things working for me in that situation. Yeah. Um, I personally use them because I hate crickets and roaches. <laughs> um, no, I mean, okay. So the, the, let's say the, 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 well, we'll talk about the cons first. All right. There are very little cons. Um, they just fly. <laughs> Th that's it. They're, they're yeah. a little harder to catch. Um, Okay, they are a little bit more demanding. They they eat a little bit more. Um, but I mean, if you were to really be breeding roaches really well, and you were to um, feed them quite regularly, pull out old food, put in new food, kept consistent with them, they'd be bang into you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but let's say if you fed it, I don't know, every other week or something like that, or once a week, or um, if that, you know, um, and you gave them just just scraps of stuff and dog food uh that also is going into your animals um and so in return you you get what you put in mm -hmm. so um with these grasshoppers i'm forced to feed them really good stuff because that's all they'll eat they only want to eat organic romaine um not that they can only eat that it's just because that's the biggest leaf available um in essentially a leafy green that they like to chew um, that's also palatable. Some of the other stuff are essentially quite thick, even though they are a big leaf. Um, it's just their, the texture in itself is quite thick. Um, and so the, the grasshoppers don't like it. Now, um, I'm using a really good wheat bran mixed with other things to also give them a great part of the diet. And that's what really gets them, uh, uh healthy. Um, and carries them through the water is just keeping them from dying because i'm keeping them so hot you know yeah and so uh I'm do they take well to spraying at all have you messed around with yeah i don't do spraying for any bug at all um yeah i mean i don't spray a bug on contact really just because so but i mean they can handle a, a tad i guess i would say but you know any more you can basically drown them because <laughs> they're <laughs> dumb <laughs> uh, they're, they're, uh, they're, uh, you know they um, like uh, 
what it is is they they breathe through their exoskeleton, right? Yeah. And so that's why you see a lot of the bugs just end up in your water bowl and just die. You know, it's like, <laughs> you know, so their exoskeleton is just taking on this water, and yeah, I, I think that's why it, what it's what kills them. Um, mm-hmm. And so, uh, and yeah, now, uh, now let's say, so let's say as far as like the pros that go with these, right? There is uh, no chirping, um, no smell. Um, they are a very fast growing bug compared to roaches and crickets. Um, let's say a very tiny baby, one, one minute old, come and is already the size of a two week old cricket. Okay. Easily, easily the size of a two week old cricket. And, um, and then they grow to a four inch adult roughly in just four weeks, Mm. maybe six if your, if your temperatures are colder, but roughly one month. Okay. Um, it takes a dubia several months just to grow a few yeah. inches. That's facts. And crickets will only grow a maximum of maybe one inch, and it's going to take them five to six weeks if you're on on task. Because if you still have those crickets, they can be four weeks old, and if you haven't been feeding them right, they're going to be dinky as hell. Um, mm-hmm. So you, if you have to, you have to actually keep up with the life cycle by feeding it a lot. Um, and so I use them, these grasshoppers, because they're also very large. Um, and now um, I only have to feed just two or three or maybe maybe five instead of an animal that's two to three feet needing to eat like 30 or something, you know, or even 15 or 20. That's still a lot, you know. Um, so I don't, I don't have to pull out a ton just to feed like three lizards. I would really only have to pull out 15, maybe 20 grasshoppers if that. And most of the time it's grasshoppers in addition with mice and chicks and eggs and whatever else that I'm also trying to feed them. Mm -hmm. Um, It's not, it's, it's rarely ever just a whole bunch of grass. Sometimes it is, but rarely ever it's just grasshoppers, you know? Yeah. Hmm. You know, I got to get ahead on feeders. Like I'm trying with the new roach species. I don't think I'm able to do grasshoppers again. So uh, the, the roaches are good though. Um, I mean, what what I recommend is for anybody, you know, go the limit for the feeders too. You know, I, it, it used to be a thing where people would say, you know, if I have to work so hard on the feeders, uh, you know, wh- why am I working so hard on the feeders but not the animals? You know, it's things like that. Mm-hmm. Or it's like, why do I have to work so hard for the for the insects? It's because that's what your things are eating. You know, you just don't want to – it's just like you. You just don't want to be eating junk and stuff like that right. all the time. And so – like again it, what you put in there is what you're going to get out um and so you know there there are some of us that will just feed um like roaches just dog food and some greens right but then there's also us that feed um we brand and spirulina and uh bee pollen and you know uh, certain types of other minerals that they're adding to that or our plant matter and flowers and stuff rather than just dog food and greens you, get, you know what I mean? Like uh, there's much more to the diet that you're essentially trying to either amplify color or the health or overall look of your animal um, and just what the animal would need because that other diet is essentially quite lacking. And um, you're uh, giving those to your to your bu- to your bugs um, going the extra mile. And it isn't even that much. All you're doing is paying a tad more for a little bit more better food, um, being more consistent with it rather than letting them dehydrate any time at all. And, um, you know, changing out like the fecal matter as much as you can, rather than just having them all within that as well, you know, um, being clean. I need to find a better way to separate the, uh, the big ones from the small ones. I'm just, man. So what you got to use is a colander system. Have you seen that yet? Is that with the different buckets? Uh, buckets or yeah, you, you can use buckets or they actually sell them now. I think, I think it's like a like 75 or a hundred bucks for the set and the a gentleman makes it and they're all acrylic pieces with the different diameters of holes. And they're just essentially a colander system made designed just for the dubious species to fall through. I'm um, going to order that like today when we yes. get done here. So you just, uh, I'll try to figure out who has it. I'll ask again on the feeder group, but basically, um, you just uh, fix them into those home Depot five gallon buckets and they are a set of now like four or five or how many ever different sizes they are. 
and the right sizes fall through, and you're gonna have to jimmy and shake it for a while. Um, and then you're left with the big ones. The big ones are at the top because they can't fall through the small holes. So that's um, all in one bucket, right? No, it's many buckets. Oh, see, I don't know. So it's like so you have to get like maybe a few buckets, and then so each bucket will have its own colander size, and then it's gonna stack into that and fall through and fall through and fall through. So you still got to put holes in the other buckets. Yeah, it's a whole set that you're getting, though, all the different sizes. Oh, so you're getting the buckets and the thing. No, 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 no. The the plates are a, are f four or five different sizes, and you're getting the whole set. And you're applying that to four or five different buckets. Okay. And then okay. that is your entire set of gotcha. what you need. Yeah. See, the um, problem I run into with the buckets right now is I, I stack these buckets up in each other with the different size holes. And man, I swear, two of those buckets. Oh yeah, I this spent five good. minutes getting unstuck from each other. You should put a buffer in between, like uh, like some cardboard or something like that. Not that smart, Kai. I'm not that smart. <laughs> I just, I just yeah. go back to wrestling my buckets every week. <laughs> but yeah, man, it's uh, it's pretty simple, I think, as far as um, getting that in. Uh, for me, I was because if you're trying to just separate um, really really tiny ones, um, you would just need to make pilot holes but they're just not that clean of holes mm -hmm. so as you're making pilot holes with the drill in your own bucket um you know the the rivet makes the plastic that actually makes a barrier instead of having them be able to crawl, crawl through um so they're like walking through the holes rather than into them and over them hmm. yeah i want to check that new system out please send it to me when you find yeah, it yeah yeah i'll find i try to find it on the feeder group but yeah it's what uh I've, I've known that for a long time, but I think this guy has actually just made it where it's actually pieces and um, you can just apply it to your own things so you don't have to make your own, essentially. Because mm -hmm. um, making your own and having the right holes is hard. Um, I myself uh, didn't really do I, – I didn't. I mean, I only needed the little guys to be separated, right? Um and then I can differentiate between the mediums and the larges, and I can right. just pull those out, pull those out if I needed to. So if you just need those three sizes, and essentially, then it's not too bad. But you know, there people want four or five different sizes of available roaches to them. So you know, right. it's uh, <clears throat> you'll have to you you if it's just yourself, you could probably get away with little tiny ones for baby animals medium ones for the other dwarfs that are adults and then the big ones for your two and three foot monitors mm -hmm. and uh yeah that's how that's how i would do it if i did it again too because uh, it basically takes all the work out if you just shimmy it through the bucket yeah that'd be for easy cleaning too and for anybody yeah. listening out there that um maybe you aren't doing it yet or you want to get into monitors we've mentioned this before but start breathing go pick up a couple cups of dubia now or and pick, go get a hundred not a couple cups because you'll take forever well you're right my, <laughs> i'm sorry my my uh my place over here it's like um 10 males and two females to a cup so wow uh so That's yeah <laughs> yeah you go start there and just um get to going on it you know um start breathing yeah. them now get work some of those kinks out and um how you're going to separate them and clean them what to feed them uh, save find out. You a bunch of money every month yeah yeah especially if you're just keeping an animal or two you could definitely right. do it in a bin probably um to keep up with your animals if you're feeding some additional things here and there um yeah i've I need to get like 10 more bins going like tomorrow <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just to keep up. Uh, I wish I had food, man. So I, yeah. I, I actually just got um, permitted for my grasshoppers. Um, I saw that. We're, we're sure in state and we're now just working on all the states, but they're all in line. So um, it should, should be, should do really well. Um, now That's as far as, yeah, man, I'm glad to be the very first guy to actually have a bunch of grasshoppers and the permit and stuff like that and be able to um, do them this way legally. Uh, I have been kind of trying to fly underneath the radar a little bit by just uh, doing mostly California sales and some other states. But, um, you know, now we're now that uh, 
it's catching steam and people are enjoying the grasshoppers at the same time, I'd like to just do things the right way as well. Um, you know, just the legalities and all that stuff like that. Uh, and so, you know, it's, it's a lot of hard work. It's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of confusion because, uh, I'm not the best of reading small print, but, um, you know, you gotta, <laughs> go, and gotta go through the loopholes or, or not even loopholes. They're not loopholes at all. They're just, hurdles that you got to jump through right um because a loophole would be making things easier and this is not not that right. at all um so uh for me i've you know always been a man i never really read those books growing up in school you know like i kind of skimmed through them or you know try to do some like uh cliff notes on the side or you know just just do those things and uh for me getting through this process basically is the same thing it's tons and tons of pages of print that you don't want to read it's you mm -hmm. know it's it's hard to comprehend for one it's hard to digest and all that you basically are just repeating these words and you don't even know what they mean <laughs> uh, there's this word that i learned the other day it's like prop yeah i can't even say it i'm gonna have to look <laughs> it right now. So, um you know this said it was like promulgate or prob it was like a mixture of problem and propagate and hold yeah. on there. So, um, problem yeah. again, yeah, something like that. But basically, <laughs> it's uh, it's to legalize what you're doing. Um, here, uh -huh. here's the word here. Uh, it, it as yeah, it's basically to get it finalized and all that stuff like that. That's that's what yeah. it means. But the word is I still can't find it. Hold on, it's right here. It's right here. Uh. Pro promulgate, P R O M U L G A T E D promulgated. So it's just to be uh, certified and all that stuff like that get going or whatever. I think that's what that means. If I don't know, me and Dean went into through together. We and you know he's got his master's and he don't even know what that meant. So <laughs> no, what? That's a new word for all of us. Uh, um, you so yeah, just, it, was, it was good. So I'd love to throw it out there that um, uh, all the customers, all the previous support, anybody that showed interest, anybody that shared, saw us at shows, um, sent us stuff. Um, dude, my my dude Tyler that sent me that awesome button up shirt with the embroidered yeah. uh, grasshoppers on it. Man, I love that. I can't actually wait to wear that one day and just nerd out at a show or something, but um, <laughs> I'm waiting, I'm waiting for that. You know, I don't want to just wear it on any occasion, but um we you know, me and Dean, uh, sorry, Alan, it's not you, but me and Dean would right. love to really thank you guys, you know, as far as um the support thus far and where we're going is just uh who knows, sky's the limit, right? Sky is the limit. And so oh, yeah, this is great, where man. Yeah, this is where we're at now, and um, the U.S. hobby deserves legal grasshoppers, you know, um, yeah. and where before it was just the U.K. and China and other places like that where you would see just people with a ton of grasshoppers and places that you saw where – these old ladies were, you know, using crops and feeding a bunch of grasshoppers and grass and greenhouses that were feeding people. Um, now I'm actually able to be one of those guys, hopefully in the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's gone from just feeding bugs, but I think it can be even more where it's sustainable food for the possibilities in the future. If people want to eat bug proteins and things like that, because that's a, you know, it's not like a huge thing where most people are disgusted by bugs, right? It is. It's just a normal I – mean, even even our faces right now, I wouldn't eat a bug burger, you know? But they take the – like some of the proteins in some of the things now are like cricket powder or like, you know, um, uh, cockroach uh, juice and grounded up cockroaches that are in somebody's protein, you know? It's just – yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of gross, but it, it's just where um, where the world's come to now because of scarce of loss of, of crops and or um, livestock, you know, basically farms going under, yeah. you know, just shortage of things in different countries. And so um, 
Roaches are disgusting. I don't want to eat a roach, but I would eat a grasshopper though. You know? <laughs> over the cheek, over the cheek. You know who? What, what yeah. would you eat, bro? Would you eat? You know what would you eat? It rather okay if you had to eat a roach or a grasshopper. What would you eat? You know? Oh man, I've I've eaten fried grasshoppers before. Yeah, they uh, yeah they're a little interesting. That that's for sure. I haven't eaten they're them. A little crunchy. Yeah, but I mean, and it's not like in the factor of in your head, like, all right, man, I'm I'm eating a cockroach. Mm-hmm. You know, these are things we step on in the hood. You know, in the ghetto, this is like, oh man, you've got roaches. <laughs> Process it, you know. Disgusting, yeah, they're disgusting, and so um, grind it up in a powder, mix it with some <clears throat> tofu product, and tell me it's a shrimp taco or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so you know who knows where this eventually goes, but I'd like to take it in air, take it to every aspect and every avenue that it it it'd be able to go. That's um, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um. So then that really, it wasn't anything at first. You know, it was just um, it's kind of a small world, but you know, a show that's near you, um, the Sacramento show in California, which is one of the biggest shows in our, that our state actually has um for quite a few years ever since i was a little kid um you know it was just a conversation that me and dean had just bumping it into each other saying hey like you know aren't you this and aren't you that or you know basically we're online people but we we only know each other online and really didn't do a whole ton in person you know until until just now you know and so um you know it's just a conversation like that and it led to us now doing a ton of grasshoppers and also though as we've you know grown with the whole thing and figuring out they're just not a regular feeder you know Mm -hmm. they're actually triggers for these very delicate animals and it's not just um these monitors but it's for people's chameleons and people's other lizards or some collar lizards that are imported and were any anything else well, i got a dude that has that you know he's like i buy them because you you're that's all they'll eat they won't eat the little crickets they don't eat the roaches for whatever reason they'll eat grubs but that's all they'll eat and so he wants to get other things into them and um awesome. uh yeah helping people's animals man it's, it's where it's at so <clears throat> is this a certain species that um, you're permitted for? Uh, yeah, I have, uh, I have basically the bird hoppers, um, vaguely to describe them all. Uh, yeah. that's, that's that's their genus. Yeah, they're called bird grasshoppers. I have uh, quite a few different types. There's there's okay. uh, ton, yeah, there's a ton of them, a ton of them all over the United States. Um, and so yeah, it's uh, I work with them because the size um ease not it's not really easy at all but it is easier compared to some of the other species um like some species take uh months just to hatch you know where the ones i have are, are very short very short time so you know the, those other ones take like several months just just to just to pop out <laughs> Um, and that's what sucks because you want things to return and hatch out in days mm-hmm. or weeks, right? But you definitely don't want to wait, have to wait like 10 months or six months or even five months. It's a long time for some bugs, you know, <clears throat> when you would want the return a bit sooner, I'd say, right? Yeah. Dude, am I going to see you like on Shark Tank in about five years with a new... Man, that'd be, that'd be tight, dude. <laughs> like, yeah, I'm on Shark Tank. I used to watch this as a kid uh, or whatever. <laughs> A new no, bug product man. to feed the world, or you know, <laughs> that would man. be awesome, though. You know, yeah, that'd joking. be really awesome. I mean, so in a in a way, I I I do help those people because they found me online, or I'll post it on somewhere, and they're like, "Man, how do you do it?" You know, obviously, no one's <laughs> either showing them or whatever they got is like a a, a thirty second clip on YouTube, and that's all they got. Mm-hmm. Or it's some language that they can't decipher, uh, and you know they basically gotta do the hard way, right? Um, but um, I've actually offered help to some of these different countries and help them not only find the species, walk them through the whole process. Um, it, I, you know, obviously I'm working something out with them too, hopefully. Um, but essentially, that's what we're doing is trying to um, teach them how to do what I'm doing here. You know, and yeah, that, um, that is awesome. 
Yeah, and they can utilize that to hopefully feed their town or feed their country or their little village. Um, you you really are talking about um, places, other places in the world. Yeah, that yeah, want to do like this, to Pakistan actually- or whatever. Yeah, so they all they like they like in the group that I have. Right, there's a ton of foreign members, and they basically come in and um, they you know they message me and Dean about. Um, just what we got going on and obviously they some are some want to buy or some obviously just are trying to do it because you know do their poor there or having food is different you know they don't they, it's just just not that easier or maybe they just want to grow it or sell it at the market you know i don't know but man um, this is huge that you're talking about. this is absolutely yeah. huge i i had yeah. no idea it went to that level that you were you know yeah, I probably helped a good like maybe dozen people now. Um, you know, every every so often I get a, a a person that wants to do this, and there's even people that are in Canada that I've helped too. So, um, you know, Canada sucks kind of though, and not Canada. You don't. Whoa. suck. Yeah, well. <laughs> Canada, you you do not suck. You're actually very gorgeous, but you're so cold that grasshoppers won't exist there too much. Uh. So. That's what sucks, <laughs> um, yeah. you know. And so, uh, yeah, Canada people, I love y'all. You know, uh, Can- uh, <laughs> Canada her her uh, Herbie podcast was one of my first homes, and yeah. so um, it, it basically um, my little boot camp for what we're doing now and how I want to have shows run and be involved and stuff like that. And um, you know, it's just the overall how 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 things flow. On a, on Way to bring it back there, Kai. You know, you just. You were on the super high of feeding the world, and then you just insulted a whole country, just like that. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry, but um, yeah, I mean, it, it does though. You guys are so cold; it's hard to keep reptiles. You guys have so many rules and regulations. It's just, oh man, you guys can't have most roach species; they're just automatically illegal. Um, so yeah, man, Canada does suck. I guess you know it does. <laughs> It does. Double down, shots fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, man. Uh, shoot. I, I. Uh, yeah, that's so cool. I wish that market. I wish that. I wish they were just like. I mean, I don't know if I can say it, just like Mexico, but I wish that. Um, it was just that easy to come over and do stuff. Yeah. Um, animal border wise and just you know uh, interstate or sorry not interstate but inner country or if is that that's a, is that the word inter- intercontinental yeah yeah intercontinental exchange where it's easy but it's actually not at all there's actually right. quite a few hurdles to jump um yeah so uh, i think that's uh i won't talk about it too much but the restrictions on European Canada imports for Australian monitors is a no more. Yeah. Uh, that's from what I heard is uh, basically that's going to be much more tighter, even if they were produced there and not the chain that they're scared about where they're smuggled from Australia or something like that. And then brought over to the UK or Canada and then papers made and then taken into the United States. Right. That was, that's uh, right. That's a very common thing that they don't want to be happening, which is happening, I believe. So, um, uh, I think it's like, isn't it a certain amount of generations they've been allowed to, if they can produce the animal there to a certain amount of sure. generations? Then I actually would- haven't even looked onto it too much. I just heard a bunch of things, and now I'm also seeing it where uh, imports are not being allowed through and. You know right. uh, why a couple people didn't get their things or normal importers where they wouldn't have um, what what I would say have saturated the market right because in in competition with actual American breeders we don't even have that much or can't produce that much so um, you know basically we we asked out but um, now we actually have quite a few people that are producing them within the states but it's still scarce for quite a few things or there are a fair amount of breeders and you guys love them so much. And you just buy all the dwarf monitors. You know? <laughs> and the molten, and that's, that's the thing is they're fun. They're pocket size. Mm-hmm. You can have a lot. And most people starting off will not just buy one. They'll buy two or three or six yeah. or whatever. Um, you know, I myself, 
I have a lot as well. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I have one or two laying around. <laughs> I have a whole army. A whole army. Oh, man. I shouldn't even count. I'm trying to count in my head, and I'm, I'm already like missing a thing or two. I know it. But uh, hopefully, you know, it's it's a hard one. I'm it's in no way am I recommending people to go out response or irresponsibly and buy um, animals that are still available to us. But at the same time, if we don't, to some degree, capture now the ability or the uh, those blood animals, lines. yeah, those bloodlines, the the resources, then we could come up to a, a point in time where. Yeah, like you know, let's we, say Dorianus, right? right? Dorianus is not bred, right? Um, and so let's say if they were just cut off and all of a sudden put on a strict sighties list, right? Right, which can happen. Islands are very small, pockets are very small. Um, all of a sudden, rules can change. They want to just protect this gorgeous animal, which probably deserves it anyways. Um, picture that. In five mm -hmm. years, ten years from now, Dorianus would be nothing. They'd probably right. be all dead because people would have raised them and killed them all. Maybe a few scarce ones that are quite old and no longer imported. Um, you know, just things change, right? It, it could happen. And that's a species that um, is very highly desired, but also very misunderstood of what they can be. Right. And so um, I think Dorianus are an incredible species, but they're almost too much beast for me. And so I don't keep them. Um, and, I'm a little bit tempted to make it a future project, but just where everything is at right now, it would be at least at least two years before I could even think about an animal like that. Because like you said, I mean... Yeah, but in two years, about, all your stuff would have flourished, and then you have no space because all those have babies now. Possibly. But see, it's been two years, and I'm just getting the, the first round of eggs, viable eggs, from the Indonesian dwarf species. Yeah. So, And that's a project I've committed to. You know, actually, funny, for the same reason, uh, as we're talking right now, they used to be your dirt cheap monitor. That yeah, was 100 bucks, 150 bucks. Right. Um, and, um, and now you'd be lucky that when babies become available, captive bred babies available, they're gone yeah. uh, before you can even... even yeah. Contact even the first timbers. Test. Yeah. Even just a simple timbers. <laughs> we're not even talking uh, Offenberg Eye or the Peacock Monitor at all. We're talking about just the other one. Yep. I think it's, another one, if people really hook them up, would be um, your Similis. Yeah. We're trying. Black and white. <laughs> yeah. A they're, black and white monitor. That's nice. They're awesome. So um, they come in black and white. Mine actually have like this um, beige kind of yellow undertone along their back. But the way the pack, I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous. There's um, there's Kevin Baker out there. Um, I've talked to him quite a bit with Aki's uh, on Timor's, um, a few other species, but the similis. I was able to, someone had a, uh, they listed it as a male similis that popped up for, I think it was like 200 bucks. Luckily you I, got it now. Yeah. I was trying, I was mashing away at that phone, you know, ah, you know, it's mine. That thing. it's mine. And it was, whether it was male or female, but from the picture they had it labeled as a male, it looked female to me. And I was like, you know what, regardless, I'm taking the chance. Cause these yeah. might filter in one every two, yeah. three years, just right. somehow. That's so how, was, basically how it is. They, they come in every so often, once in a while. Right. And uh, people buy them, and they are different than what they thought. Um, let's say even if they're gorgeous, right? Right. They can be pretty shy animals, just like a Timmers, just like Offenbergs, if you set them up um, where they can hide and stuff. Uh, so they'll, they'll definitely utilize it. And, and so the, I think people are just deterred by little guys that just hide all the time. It's, it's empty cage syndrome, and it's kind of unrewarding, right? Oh, yeah. It, it's, yeah. I'm dealing a lot with that. But I want to commit to yeah. making these animals available for the hobby. And I, I really believe when we start hitting Yo, man, I think, generations. Uh, I think once you get a uh, – so they're all adults now? You're similis, right? The similis – everything I have is adults. Yeah. They've, I've raised up some babies. The similis were adults when I got them. 
Um, yeah. And I had some Timors that were adults, some Offenberg guy that were adults. But then I also acquired um, some real young hatchlings um, of the Offenberg guy and the, the Timors. So I raised those up. Um, those are adults, and um, some of those are actually some of the animals that are now uh, laying eggs and what. Well, so I don't. There's there's some work to be done, honestly, because I have some animals that were just laying one or two eggs, right? Yeah. So I got three three peacock monitor eggs, and I have one uh, Timor egg. Now I see veins in the in the peacock eggs. Um, nothing yet in the team or egg. So it's still undetermined whether that's good or not, but I know at least I got a female um, yeah. that can get some stuff done. And let's see, I, I think I have if this is their first time. Maybe that's their first time run. Right. It's not really that great. Right. Right. And I think I have, let's see, six. I have, I'm working with 10 total <clears throat> team or monitors and uh, two, let's see. No, um, Four of them were either adults or sub-adults. And then the other six um, came in as hatchlings. Now, Kevin had four of those. I had two of those. And it turned out that it, it they all came in together. Uh, the two that I got were males. And the four that he got were females. So initially, I'd sent him one. And he was going to send back a female. And we're going to work on it like that. But I think at this point he wanted to focus on his Ackies and, and his Similis that he does have. Yeah. Cause he's the other person working with him. I hope he doesn't mind me talking about it, but um, I think he shared it enough. So it's, it's not like I'm, you yeah. know, letting the cat yeah. out of the bag. But, Maybe uh, you can uh, do what uh, we talked about earlier and apply now that they're into the thing. Let's say, would they do whatever they do until like end of summer or midsummer mm -hmm. and then just take them down? And uh, yeah, go through that whole thing where they basically are all all your female, all your female dwarf endos are at uh, the same level, basically right. low maintenance, same temperature, probably even placed all in the same area, so they can have the same consistency, and then um, you know fed fed basically on the same schedule, um, and be pretty strict with how you take them down as far as coolness, you know get right. down to 65 ish at nighttime and in the cold areas and stuff like that. And then take them up and bring them up during, I don't know, however long you feel like doing it, but maybe at least two to three months of being low and then yeah. coming up. Yeah. So I think I'm going to treat them very similar to the snakes. I think November I'm going to start cooling. I'll probably keep it cool. Um, a stable i'll start cooling it down then into december december january and then coming up in february uh again until i reach more of a stable temp in around march yeah. uh, very similar to some of the things i'm doing with some of the snakes um and yeah see how that works and uh it's it's all learning for me from here there's some information out there on this stuff but at the same time i'm not seeing anyone uh, people have produced them in the past. Um, so it's not that, but I, I you know, it's not a really consistent, right. And I still might be talking to somebody that's over on the East coast and my, my, um, seasons, my temperatures throughout the year, are just different here. So it's, it's kind of figuring it out to that degree myself yeah. and what's going on. Um, so yeah, there's some, some work to be done, but, um, and for all the listeners out there, this is, you know, I'll, I'll pick Kai's brain about this stuff or we're picking each other's brains on, on different things throughout the week. Uh, or, you know, it, it's just good to have a sounding board kind of, it's like, am I crazy for thinking this? And then yeah. have you reinforce it with the same thoughts you've had going through some of this uh, crazy shenanigans with animals. So, you know, it's a good resource. And it, <clears throat> again, we've talked a little bit about this to people, but um, it's kind of where this whole podcast originated out of the ideas, you know, we wanted to, we wanted somewhere where we could access information and it seemed like there wasn't a whole lot of available sources in one place to get information. So we're hoping to provide that to you guys. And um, there's no doubt that the way we keep and the, how we do things is still going to change from now to let's say, you know, we're, we're three years, years from now. This. 
yeah, yeah. we can uh we, we can, can better at it hopefully yeah. yeah and with everybody else out there um we're watching you too you know if if you contact us if you follow us we're also watching what you're doing and as you're trying out different things um yeah you know how they work yep yeah yeah that's, that's what it's all about really um you know uh i'm a product of the community essentially right i'm like the middle child watching all these uh, old school guys do stuff and now that I'm grown and it's been like, you know, several years of really working at it, copying, essentially copying them, mm -hmm. whether it's like looking at their pictures and just asking what's your temperature of your soil or what type of soil did you use and using the same thing or asking them about their lamps and taking a picture or, you know, looking at the picture, how they have it set up and doing the same thing or utilizing the same bulb. Um, right. And then also, you know, there's, uh that's just how we kind of learn from each other you know and uh what you have to really bring to the hobby um mm -hmm. in a sense yeah yep and um i think kai would agree with me on this is you could start off copying that's what we can say you could start off with a care sheet it's it's where you start for an animal keeping that animal and it might be enough to keep them alive and going but it's up to you to kind of think freely and look at your animal and realize what's going on. If you're looking at your animal and your animal looks lethargic, looks dry, um, you have to address these problems. Some of it might be, here's a little plug, Kai, getting some grasshoppers from Kai. <laughs> yeah. In reality, you might have a wild caught shy animal and um, it has, it's been reluctant to eat whatever you've been offering. So, you know, you might need to switch around your, your cage setup so it's offering the animal the right things, as well as the ability to um, feel secure in its own cage, but then offering them something that they want to eat that's going to elicit that food response. Um, getting water into that animal, sometimes just having a dish and keeping it up is, ooh, <laughs> got some music in there, <laughs> is not enough. Um, so you might have to realize that you have to spray the cage. And in the process of spraying the cage, you realize that your setup might become too humid with the amount of moisture you already have in the soil and a water bowl. So in reality, to get your animal to drink, you need to keep the substrate a little bit drier. A water bowl is not really doing much for you. So you spray twice a day. You know, once maybe after the heat lamps have been on, everything's geared up for the day. And then again, an hour before they go off. So it gets a little time to dry out because um, all different yeah. ideas. These are these are just things I'm throwing out there for you guys yeah. to think about that. You know, it's basically just allowing your cage to evaporate before you go and drench it again. Right. Yeah, it's it, that balance. So but it, these are the mm. things that they're that you might not have in a care sheet that you might yeah. run up in. And um, so while those are good starting points, it's up to you to just say that um, my animal looks crusty. You know, how do I get water into this thing? Right. Or um, how do I get food into this thing? How do I help this animal then digest food? How do I yeah. give them the ability to heat up and be active? And, um, and, and uh, like, let's say if you have very thin amounts of soil, right? Um your animal is going to look a little crusty if you're if it's not saturated the air is in there it may spend a lot of time in the water that's not always the greatest thing either mm -hmm. um they can definitely get some uh, sores and stuff like that or getting waterlogged or mm -hmm. um you know things like that but really having them being able to get dry is is important now let's say if they're shedding right you're not always going to be able to soak them or even spray them. And sometimes that's not enough. Right. What the animal does is if you have a deep burrow retreat and it doesn't have to be a nest bin, really, it's just a deep amounts of soil. Um, even males, males will go down there and let's say they are in deep shedding. If they have this available, the stuff just comes right off. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the skin will be having just enough amounts of moisture to it that it's soaking up from the bedding and it's going to have it come off rather than you spritzing and spraying your closure, which 
then takes the humidity too high if it ha if if it is or and or making the cage too wet and then also causing more issues right. that that whole having uh an option to have deep bedding really helps with those toe tips and tail tips and mm -hmm. and just uh overall the shedding part now um i've seen people say you know my animals are always in shed and they're always doing this which is somewhat true but they shouldn't have overlapping sheds right. that's not what is your that's not what your goal is or anything like that you, that's actually bad so you want to have sheds that are coming off properly every 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 month or however they come off right and and fluff off and then you know properly have the other one but if you're it's not getting off and you got stuff stuck on the back or uh, toe areas or there's like a whole foot and a toe you didn't recognize and then all of a sudden you're not paying attention to that for weeks and that toe is now constricted um, it can go a couple ways. It can, you know, you can get it to a point where it's savable, but it's on a last limb type deal. Mm -hmm. You might have to just cut it off anyways, or it'll break off itself because it's been, been, been dehydrated and basically rotten off or um, this all that is dead tissue now. Right. Um, that's how the sheds work. And so if they're stuck on there, um, you know, it's going to cause an issue. So, um, you know, those people that are go through that and, you know, if you guys have big lizards and they're essentially always shedding, you know, soaking them and getting them wet isn't just enough. Right. And so I find my animals, like, let's say my, even my three foot male Indicus, they don't exactly have a, like a three by three nest bin, but they have a, a dip of soil that's several inches high or maybe even almost a foot high. And that soil is just deep enough for them to dig and they just lodge themselves in it. And that's all they need. You know, it's nothing crazy. And, um, and that's what they burrow in when they need to. And then it helps stuff just come right off. I noticed the same thing. Um, my, okay. I, I keep things that in a way that work for me a lot of times and, things that I've noticed and developed. So my, my Aki's for the most part, uh, Tristis also, I keep very dry. Um, I might give them a spike of humidity by spraying once or twice a week. I'm at that point now. Um, the Tristis do have standing water. Um, the Aki's might get water when I pass by the cage and, and decide to do it. Um, but I also have a, nest bin slash humidity box that the animals frequent now they they go in, they go in and out of there as they please um <clears throat> and i'll say i i with that group of animals that's in that cage i've never had any shedding issues and it's what works for me they have a retreat um that's high humidity in that little bit of space that's between the lid of the nest box and the actual um substrate that's in there and yep. then the substrate itself is moist if they want to burrow down and go in there. So they have those different choices still within that cage, even though the amount of humidity within the actual cage might be well. 20 yeah. to 15 percent, you know. Yeah, um, like uh, 30 to 40 or something like that. You know, that's, that's still pretty low. But now that's where we talk about our options and you're let's we're, let's say we're still talking about indonesian species but it's not even true because some of the australian species and the african species are also hot in human places too right so it's not just it's true Indo, it's not just indonesia now um let's say most care sheets or most even recommendations are going to tell you hey have an have an ambient humidity of like 60 70 80 percent you know but um, that's that is a fair fair to achieve, fair to easy to achieve. Don't get me wrong, and that's not the hard part. The hard part is actually keeping it from being too wet. Because some people right. just they're they're just so um, I guess head, headstrong or so adamant on making sure the humidity doesn't go below seventy five or something like that. Right. And in all truth, it can go to that temperature or that. Um, humidity percentage 
and also get even a little bit lower. Even for these Indo species that I have at my house, I have them drop to 30 and 20% sometimes, but they still have an option and a bin to go to or deep soil option to go to and dig and nest in and, and all that stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, that is nearly almost 90% uh, humidity down there. I mean, if it were to be 100, it'd be practically raining. And yeah. so it's wet, you know, and now it'd be only really 100 if you were to saturate it and you had things going on for just a long time. But you can't do that in an enclosure because there has the water has to go somewhere and and or it may wet your soil too much and um, that's not really what you want to do when most people it's just, it just sprays for like 30 seconds every three or four hours or something you know right it, it just saturates it just enough and so that's your balance there of bringing it back up if you need to um, now let's say if your soil came down and all of a sudden you're extremely dry um, you or aren't you aren't going to be spraying at all because you're just going to hit the surface and it'll give you a a really misread on what the real depth is and so i just get like i said i get these arizona gallons that i buy from costco <laughs> and i empty them out after i drink them and rinse them off and i use them as my normal jugs and i fill those bad boys up and i just saturate the whole soil you know use my hands and do a shuffle real quick making sure that the water spreads and saturates on the dry stuff and then yeah um, it settles right and so that's what i'm normally doing to turn soil regardless um, and so what, it's what I do is, so I have, um, nest bin in a certain size tote that I have within these cages, especially for the dwarf monitors. And then I have a, um, larger tote, something like a 27 gallon tote that I will then pour the, uh, if I, <laughs> unless there's eggs in there or a possibility of eggs in there, then I'm like an archeologist with a, a toothbrush you know, and a spoon scooping every little bit of a uh, soil out there a little bit by little bit. But as long as I'm sure there's no eggs in there, I'll just take the nest bin. I'll dump it out in the bigger tote and then I'll, I'll remix the whole thing, add water as needed, which is usually I'll, I'll, instead of those Arizona jugs you're talking about, mine's those um, <clears throat> those water jugs that have the handle connected to the, the top, basically. <laughs> and yeah. I'll, I'll I fill those up with the hose um, at the warehouse and then. I'll add a little bit of water in there and I'll remix it till it feels the right consistency for me. And then um, I'll put that in back in the cage, you know, I'll, I'll refill the original nest bin and put that back in the cage. And you know, something else I've done. Um, I think you've talked about letting stuff break down to a certain loaminess of that, that substrate and soil is um, in certain cages, just the way I have it, the, the soil, even though it has a lid and a hole in the lid of the tote, that's the nest box. Yeah, it was drying out at a rate that I didn't like. So mm -hmm. I have covered the top of the substrate in the nest box with leaf litter or sphagnum moss. And it's worked for me to um, to sit as a, another barrier within that that keeps the soil where I want it to be. So, yeah, um, that's only in one or two cages for various reasons. But. For me, I just add more sand and water. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a 70 ratio of sand now for everything almost it's like all right yeah. here's 50 50 and here's more sand and it holds better it, it does and here okay if i'm being real honest um there's a couple of animals adult animals that i've gone more with i played with it where i might be like 60 percent cocoa core and that's that's honestly just because i'm tired of lifting a 75 <laughs> pound box out of the uh uh, bending over into this cage and reaching out, hurting my back doing it. And so yeah. I know if I can get away with it with certain animals, I'll I'll do that for my own purposes. I had a day, oh man, I had a day where my back went out and I'm in the warehouse and it was spasm every time I moved. I couldn't even roll up the uh, the door to get yeah. out. I had to call my wife, babe, come get me. <laughs> I, I can't roll up the door. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, mm. man, that's funny. I had forgotten about that. Um, but yeah, I, I generally, if it's one I can easily get to, um, I, I have started using a lot more sand product or that PG&E sand that I've mentioned, kind of like that. Um, 
and just <coughs> enough of that that organic material um, to just yeah. give it that that consistency that I'm looking for. And I might be adding stuff to it. I add like twigs to it. This certain mm-hmm. uh, I use a uh, sunshine sphagnum and uh, that has that has twigs to it too. Um, I use uh, like basically I use the leaf litter on the stem, so it's like a two in one type deal. I don't yeah. take the leaves off. I just throw the stems in there. And what that does is uh, the stems as they are in the soil, right, and they be, they they they'll overlap and cross each other. And the lizard is able to still dig through those, and they can actually uh, cater to the entrance hole and actually the whole thing in itself. Um, that's where many monitors would dig in the wild is they'll uproot a rooting system and just dump eggs there or, or nest there or something like that uh, in between this you know gap or something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I um, think I was watching on something where for Aki's, um, who was it? Yeah, oh, it was Ron St. Pierre. He just he fills a tote like almost overflowing with that cocoa core. And yeah. um, they're nesting in there. And it uh, the way he described it is that acts like the stuff in the in a termite mound, basically, and kind of replicating, you know, that um, broken down fibrous type of uh, material that's within there. So I don't use straight cocoa core. Um, uh, I use it mixed with sand, but. You know, yeah. I, I think it was interesting regardless. So, um, man, we are covering what are two topics. Yeah. We're <laughs> yeah, just a little, this, this is how this is what it is. This, this is this conversation is from uh, just winging it from having a gentleman not be able to sh- come on from technical difficulties. So we're just, yeah. uh, you know, just conversing about what we kind of have going on and things like that. And, um, yeah, really. That's just uh, that's just it for this this one, you know. Just putting yeah. things together as much as we can. Yeah, we're already uh, this one can can add it to the other one. It's going to be a good three hour conversation. Oh yeah, so it's not even uh, it's not just a quick you know thing. It's actually quite long. So it's a good amount of information on there as far as uh, how many topics we cover. Um, yeah. in relate in relation to many of them, and you know, just back and forth and. Uh, really um, hooking up the Indo species, right? And and even the African species later on. It's just none of those are our forte at the moment, so we don't have African species. Oh wait, no, remember. hold on. I I got some African. Oh species. yeah, you have a you have a savanna, right? Yeah. And, uh, okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, he has he has one savanna. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> he's, she's, uh, you know. she's betrothed. Her boyfriend's well, already out there. <laughs> we're not uh, we're not breeding though any of the African species at the moment, but right. some of the stuff that we applied, like when Linnea was here, um, we apply the same thing to her animals that are right. from Africa. And uh, a gentleman that breeds white throats is who taught me how to be very strict on what I'm doing as well with my animals. So um, it's uh, it's it's applied. I'm I'm hoping that we can be able to utilize that, and other people can try to utilize this. I know. Without the picture graph diagram that I have drawn up, um, that I gave to Alan and that I have for myself for most of my enclosures, um, if you guys need to see that personally or get a better idea on what I'm talking about, um, then you know feel free to message me or you know contact me in any way. Um, I'm, you can find me on Facebook; it's the easiest, and uh, it's just Kai Fan. Now, uh, as far as uh, yeah, as far as that goes, you know, just just let me know if you guys need any 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 help with that at all. Yeah, it's um, it, it's very. I'm sure there are plenty of people that have had some luck with Indo species, just kind of letting them adapt to their routine over a year or two. Um, but this is a much more measured um, applicable application to yeah. what you're doing, where you actually know. Right. right. And it's yeah. actually good because then when you have it written out, you can actually twi- tweak those things a little bit and you know yeah. exactly what you're tweaking. It's not just sprinkling that magic fairy dust on there and hoping right. something changes. Yeah. So. It, it's actually trying to try to make things hook up. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, for if you want to take it for 20 plus years of however long monitor keeping has really been in 
you know, uh, like a breeding aspect and stuff like that. Uh, before we we're just killing them in, in boxes and tanks. Right. But now we're, a lot of us are taking a much more, uh, uh, I guess, educated stance and all that stuff like that backed up with all that, you know? And so having, uh, having the ability to hook them up and get it going has been quite hard. And, yeah. um, everybody was, you know, obviously, not having success i don't want to say failing but yeah it could be a bit of failing as well where things are dying or eggs are dying or you're you know they're like i i, I kind of break it down in um, many groups but you're gonna have to hit like four levels of success that you have to pass and um you know like the very first one is just getting animals to hook up just right. having a pair or having the right sex and actually getting them to hook up so right. having one and one and one is one thing, but then breeding and all that stuff is is the is the another hard part. And then actually getting viable eggs from those Indonesia species because there's breeding and stuff, but not a lot of eggs. And sometimes, yeah. let's say, getting to that even that gravid point right before they lay the eggs. Right, some people they just all of a sudden reabsorb or something like that. Yeah. Um, or and you know, um, it's basically. Uh, it leaves you in the dark because you don't know what's really going on and you don't know what the animal's body is doing, obviously, because you're not in it. You're not it. So um, you're right. left confused. But, you know, the other step would be to actually get eggs that are viable. And then once you get eggs to then incubate them and, and hatch them, you know, and right. um, we'll probably have a section for the incubating thing as well, because I believe it's a much, uh, much bigger topic than just hooking up an incubator and popping eggs in. It's not, it's yeah. not that easy. And, um, you know, you, you'll hear time and time again that monitors are hard and eggs are monitor eggs are hard. Or if you look at that time frame, 160 to 210 days, 240 days, that's a lot of time to fail. <laughs> and, and, um, I mean, your power could go out. You're, um, you'll go through three different seasons. Yeah. And you basically go from mild to hot. And then you can end up in in the cold season throughout all that. So it's like, oh, right. man, things change, right? Um, and we can, we, can, we can crack into it a little bit right now because we have some time and we're not on the limit or anything. But people, myself and Alan are included, but we are getting all the way to eggs. But mm -hmm. once we're incubating them, they don't always go the distance. It's right. our fault or it's incubating's fault or it's possibly the genetic and the parents' fault or whatever, and poor in calcium or heat spikes. All of these are, are topics that we will be covering um, in the episode for incubating. Right. Um, and, um, you know, it's not – again, I, I love my guys over at, at Sim Container, John and Alex. Um but it'll be talking about all methods of incubating, not just the sim container that we use, or um, but the old school style of just vermiculite and perlite one on one ratio, or some of the new things that some of us are trying out now, like the um, turfus. I believe that's how you pronounce it, but mm -hmm. it's those the little clay pebble rocks that um, Rapashi has, or hatch or hatch right sells, or they also right. sell them in bonsai stores and nurseries and they, all they are is just little pebbles. Um, you essentially use them. So certain plants don't drown. Mm -hmm. And so these eggs set on top of it are supposed to be helping with that. But yeah, we'll, we'll cover all this in that, in that podcast. And you know, I think so, that'd be good. So, yeah, man. Uh, so you guys uh, look out for that one. If uh, incubating has possibly been an issue for you, I think we've tried to cover this a little bit, but we'll get into it much, much more detailed because um, I myself have picked up new information, talking to more and more people because I myself am still failing as well. I've haven't really had great success with Kimberly's, even though I am getting eggs all the time. So, so yeah, um, it's probably going to close up this uh, this episode. Um, and thank you guys for listening and everything like that. Yeah, um, yeah. People, you you mentioned your Facebook, but also your Instagram. Well, my Instagram is uh, big underscore lizard one o three one the letter o the number three, and uh, um, you can find me on YouTube as well uh, under Mangrove Mecca. Um, that's uh, Mangrove, and Mecca is M E C C A, um, and. Uh, 
Facebook is where I'm very much most responsive, to be honest. Um, and so Kai fan, which is K H A I space P H A N as in Nancy. Uh, for me, guys, yeah. yeah, you can find me at Origins. It's Origins with an S underscore Reptile, just Reptile, no S on Instagram, and Origins Reptile on Facebook. Um, I've had some people. Uh, I just feel like I have to say this. I'm not being rude. I've had you um, throw out a friend request on Facebook to Alan Stevens, and it's just something I I keep separate, or I'm trying to. Because I, it's two different worlds to operate in. And so I don't, because my family can see stuff I'm tagged in and whatnot. So they don't need all my reptile stuff. <laughs> their feet. So um, I'm trying to protect them a little bit. So it's not out of being rude. Uh, but definitely, if you if you follow me on Instagram, it's where um, I'm actually a lot more active for that part of my life. So, um, yeah, I'll get back to you, share stuff with you, converse with you, or just on Facebook or the messenger app. Uh, that one works too, either through origins reptile or, uh, under my name, Alan Stevens. But that being said, uh, again, go on and check out Morelia Python radio.com. Uh, look at their Patreon. If you can subscribe and, uh, or follow and join up, help this content to come out. Um, there's all kinds of things going on. Um, some really, really knowledgeable people talking about various topics, um, not just monitors or not just carpet pythons, but um, a little, little bit for everybody. Right. And even the the yeah. history of um, herpet culture and man, there's a lot there. There's so much. Uh, I mean, one day I hope to either be able to bring it here or for everybody out there to hear some of the beginnings of like U.S. Arc and how it came together. Um, and one of the reasons we even get to keep a species such as Ackies and the battle that went on just to make that happen, um, is an incredible story. So I believe that that deserves the right to be, um, preserved on this kind of new platform and media because of the way technology progresses, you know, um, we're not keeping around magazines so much anymore. So it'd be something that's available to everybody to, to, uh, listen to. And uh, yeah. I happen to know that Eric uh, Burt does keep a lot of uh, information and snippets. So, uh, yeah, go on and, and support him um, through the Patreon and the whole network, everybody that's on there. But also, we mentioned U.S. Art. Go on and support U.S. Art. They're protecting our right to keep these animals. So um, there might not even be a chance to bring Dorianus to the reptile hobby if we lose the right to keep it in the first place. We won't even get to scratch without, the surface. Without, without people taking into consideration that this is a species that needs work. Right. Um, one of the top animals that come in all the time, very misunderstood and not produced for sure. Yep. Um, so yeah. Uh, lastly, I'd want to be able to just, I know I said this at the, the beginning a little bit, but thank you everybody for your guys' um, response and feedback and just sharing. And I mean, your simple post about it, uh, we really, really appreciate it. Um, we, again, we never really expected it to take off or be liked the way you guys are loving it. So thank you. Yeah. And keep sending us uh, questions. Keep sending, uh, yeah, keep sending us questions. So it basically gives us stuff to be able to cover for you guys as well. Cause we, as much as this is a, you know, we have our own conversations and our own animals and we talked about other people's things. Um, there is, still a uh, a group of people out there that we might not have reached yet, you know, and um, mm -hmm. we still want to be able to have that opportunity. So yeah, message us, feel free. All right. Thank you guys for listening.